All right. Well, hi, everybody. Time for us to um, move into a new phase of the course. We're going to be um, looking at a, a part of perturbation theory called boundary layer methods. We touched on these a little bit. Um, I think it was in the last lecture, but we'll now be spending several lectures on them. Um, these come up in lots of different parts of science and engineering. I, I have run into them myself in work in neurobiology or uh, cardiology. If you have two very different time scales, like say the time it takes for a neuron to charge up, which could be gradual, and then spike, which could be very fast, or the same thing with a heart cell discharging suddenly and then slowly charging back up. Um, the boundary layer would refer to that short time when the spike is happening. And um, that gets, when you're solving equations relating to that, you then match the, the rapid behavior onto the slower behavior. That's what these techniques will do. Actually, the theory came about, I think, first in fluid dynamics, where boundary layers really refer to a layer of fluid. It could be air, it could be water, um, close to the boundary of some region. Um, Richard Feynman, I think, mentions in his physics lectures somewhere, I may be making this up, but I feel like I remember this, that he says, go up to your attic and look at the fan or look at a fan on the ceiling and you'll see that there's a thin layer of dust on it, which seems a little surprising because the fan is spinning so fast. You know, the blades move really fast. Why don't the little dust particles blow off? And they don't because in fluid dynamics, the fluid a boundary condition is that the velocity goes to zero at the boundary, the so-called no slip condition. And so right at the boundary on the fan, right attached to the fan, the air is not blowing there and that allows dust particles to stick. So um, it's a big deal in fluid dynamics to work out fluid flow outside the boundary layer and then in near the, the boundary of the region. Anyway, I don't know that we'll be talking about those examples here. I just want to be doing the math of boundary layer theory. But it, it does come up, as I say, in, in lots of different parts of science. OK, so um, let me share my screen. OK. Good. All right. So it is uh, part six, if you're keeping track um, of the course. And if you want to read about this in Bender and Orsog, chapter nine would be the place. So let's start with a very introductory example. This is a, one of these artificially contrived examples that we can solve exactly. And it will illustrate some of the methods that will continue to apply even when we can't solve the problem exactly. So this introductory example, um, before I dive into it, I just want to say, like, from a mathematical point of view, you could think of boundary layer theory as a, a technique that comes up in singular perturbation problems, that is, where regular perturbation theory doesn't work, um, especially when you have a, a differential equation with a small parameter in it, an epsilon, multiplying the highest derivative in the equation. Well, in the example we're going to do today, that'll be the case. So you can see that something kind of fishy could occur if you just naively say, well, set epsilon to zero, you will then lose the highest derivative, which will change the order of the differential equation. And that is a major qualitative change to lose the highest derivative, as you'll see. So let me just dive into this first example. All right, so um, I've written out some stuff ahead of time to save a little more time later on. This, this example in Bender and Orsog is this second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. So it's exactly solvable by any of the techniques you would have learned in your first differential equations course. But you see it's got some epsilons in it, in particular an epsilon multiplying this highest derivative, the second derivative. There's also a gratuitous epsilon sitting here which is not really qualitatively important, but has the advantage that it makes the problem really algebraically convenient. 
as you'll see in a minute. Okay, so anyway, I got this second order equation for y as a function of x. And we're gonna have boundary conditions on it that at the left end, so suppose this is happening on the interval from zero to one, at the left end, y of zero is zero, and at the right end, y of one is one. And I'll frequently use the abbreviation BC to mean boundary conditions in this context. Okay, now first, just to make it clear that it really is a singular problem, suppose we just did the naive thing that we discussed in some previous lectures of doing regular perturbation theory, meaning we just guess a power series in epsilon times unknown functions, y0, y1, and so on. You could try that. If you plug it in, here's what will happen. So the differential equation, I'm just substituting for y double prime. You get y zero double prime plus epsilon y one double prime. Similarly, I can substitute for the first derivative. And here I'm substituting for the function itself. Okay, so you put everything in. Meanwhile, you should also um, rewrite the boundary conditions, which we have here for the full you know, behavior, full solution y. But perturbatively, this would say y0 of 0 plus epsilon y1 of 0 to, to satisfy this condition should be 0. And let me ignore the quadratic terms in epsilon for now. Um, you have to interpret an equation like this as a power series equation, right? This is supposed to be true for all epsilon. Um, so this is the 0 function the zero power series in epsilon. In other words, we should equate coefficients of different like powers of epsilon on both sides to read off boundary conditions at each order of perturbation theory. So we'll do that in a minute. And then similarly, we have boundary conditions at the other end right there. Okay, so now let us just look at what's going on at order one, meaning all the stuff that has no epsilons in it. So, here at order one, uh, I mean, this whole term has an epsilon in front of it, so that's all order epsilon. To get an order one term, I have to do one times y zero prime, or I could do this y zero, but everything else has an epsilon in front of it. So those are the only two terms at order one. And all of that equals this zero on the right-hand side. Meanwhile, we have two boundary conditions at order one, which is y zero of zero is zero and y zero of one is one. Because as I say, you should think of this right-hand side as like, I mean, just to write it explicitly, you could think of it as like zero plus zero epsilon plus zero epsilon squared plus dot, dot, dot. And this is one plus zero epsilon plus zero epsilon squared, et cetera. And then we're equating at order one, this with this and this with that. So I have these boundary conditions and already you see we're having trouble because I've got a first order equation but I have two boundary conditions on it. That's horrifying, right? That is overdetermined. If you, have, if you have a first order equation, you expect to have one arbitrary constant. And with one arbitrary constant, you're not gonna generally be able to satisfy two side conditions. There just isn't enough wiggle room. So we can see that explicitly. By the way, why did this happen? I mean, notice that this has become a first order equation, whereas we started with something that was a second order equation. Right? But what happened was by looking at order one, we've lost this whole term. That term only seems to appear formally at order epsilon. So we converted a second order equation into a first order equation and that's causing massive trouble for regular perturbation theory. So let's just see that there is no solution to this. I mean, if you solve this little first order differential equation by separation of variables, you'll get exponential solution. Uh, of this form, some unknown constant times e to the minus x. Um, and then when you impose one of the boundary conditions, say this one, y of zero, uh, y zero of zero is zero, plugging that in, 
you're going to get that the constant has to be zero, which means then that the function y zero is identically zero. It's zero everywhere. And that's nasty because then there's no hope of satisfying the boundary condition on the right side, right? Zero is not one. So there's no way to satisfy both boundary conditions and the differential equation at order one. And so in that sense, regular perturbation theory is failing us, which is no surprise because as I said, this is problem is a singularly perturbed problem. And this is one indication of it. So maybe I'll pause there to see if you're still with me. You wanna ask anything? Okay, good so far. Well, so if if we included another order of epsilon, would yeah. this still would it, it still be would not this help? <laughs> mm. It wouldn't help. I mean, the method is already breaking down at order one. I could write out the order epsilon equations, but there's no point because I can't even satisfy the order one equation. Right. Okay. So yeah, so it's just totally crashed from the very beginning. Yeah. Okay. So all right, now let's first understand what's happening to this problem that's causing the trouble. And then I'll spend the rest of the lecture developing a method for solving a problem like this approximately, even if we didn't know the exact solution. All right, so the exact solution, as I say, this is an easy problem because it is linear with constant coefficients. So um, we know that you just guess exponential solutions in cases like that. So let me say y equals e to the lambda x for some unknown um eigenvalue really it is an unknown eigenvalue lambda all right so if you plug that in you'll get a bunch of e to the lambda x's when you because when you differentiate it you keep getting e to the lambda x but then you'll keep pulling down a factor of lambda for each derivative so the characteristic equation for the lambda will end up being this after we cancel out the e to the lambda x on both sides so this is the governing equation for the lambda. Um, and here's where the problem has been contrived, that factors, right? That characteristic equation is just epsilon lambda plus one times lambda plus one. And so you can read off the eigenvalues. They're nice and clean. They're just, the roots are minus one over epsilon and minus one. And so now we can write the general solution of this as a superposition of those two exponentials, linear combination. So there it is. Um, C1 e to the minus x plus C2 e to the minus one over epsilon times x, in other words, that term. And now we have two constants and we can find from the boundary conditions what those two constants are. If I plug in y of zero is zero, that then says C1 e to the zero, that's one. So C1 plus C2 has to be zero. That gives me that condition. C1 is negative C2. And then the other condition is Y1 of, Y at one is one, which leads to this messy expression. But then I can replace C2 by negative C1 and I can solve for C1 by just dividing through. So with that kind of technique for finding C1 and C2, we're led to this exact solution for our problem, which looks um, a little complicated, but notice all it's got is these two exponentials on top as functions of X, and it's got some constants in the bottom. <clears throat> okay, so that's our exact solution and uh, well, I guess the thing that you should be noticing first is this term, this e to the minus x over epsilon, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is interesting in that it, it shows an essential singularity at epsilon equals zero. <coughs> Right, that's a, that's a nasty expression as epsilon goes to zero. Um, I mean, in one way, it looks like it's harmless as epsilon goes to zero from the positive side, this term is approaching e to the negative infinity. So that's very small. That's a transcendentally small term. 
then actually this thing would be negligible um, for small enough epsilon at any given fixed X. But from the standpoint of um, power series methods, that term is horrendous because uh, this does not have a good Taylor series expansion in epsilon due to its having an essential singularity at epsilon equals zero. So it doesn't have a convergent Taylor or Maclaurin expansion um, about epsilon equals zero. And that means the regular perturbation theory cannot work because it's based on, you know, assuming that you can get away with power series. Okay, so that's sort of what caused the trouble for regular perturbation theory. As I say, this term is numerically small. Um, it's actually, you know, a very tiny number, as long as X is sufficiently far from zero. Let's say if X is greater than just as a ballpark number, 10 epsilon, you know, what would happen then? We'd have something, we, this term would become E to the minus 10th which is a tiny number. So numerically, that term is gonna be small as long as X gets big compared to epsilon. And remember epsilon is going to zero. So that might not seem like such a difficult thing to achieve. Um, on the other hand, if we're really interested in what happens as epsilon goes to zero, then the X you know, that we're gonna to have to worry about is gonna keep getting closer and closer to that left edge. So there's gonna be a boundary layer, something funny happening at the left edge of this uh, problem near X equals zero. But anyway, given the, that this term is numerically small, we might say X equals 10 epsilon is sort of outside the boundary layer. That's where the dust would blow off the fan. Whereas if we had X much smaller than epsilon, say like a 10th of epsilon, you're now inside the layer and something else is happening in there. Um, so we'll, we'll see more precisely what I'm talking about in a few minutes. But first, I think it's helpful to just look visually at what is this exact solution doing? Let's look at the graph of the Y of X as epsilon goes to zero. So this is shown in Bender and Orsog, but I think it's helpful for us to just redo it in Mathematica. So I did that earlier today. Um, let me stop sharing this screen. And uh, I'll share a different one. Okay, so yeah, now let me pull this down. Okay, so here's the exact solution. Um, and then here is, okay, what is this expression? I'm gonna call this the outer solution. It would be, the behavior that we would observe outside the boundary layer. So to understand what's going on there, think about this expression at a given value of X. So fix an X greater than zero, and now let epsilon get small. All right, so you're holding X fixed, let epsilon go to zero. As epsilon goes to zero, I mentioned this term is becoming like E to the minus infinity. So that, let's just ignore this second exponential term up here at any fixed X. If I just ignore it for sufficiently small epsilon, and likewise, I just ignore this term for the same reason, then I would get e to the one minus x over one. And so that's what at y out refers to. You see here, y out is exponential of one minus x. It's this curve shown here in blue, which is a very nice gradual exponential decay as a function of x. And what I'm showing is that this exact solution, the exact solution here, I'm plugging in different values of epsilon, 0.1 or 0.05. Those hug the exact solution quite nicely as long as X is big compared to the epsilon. Like here, epsilon was 1 10th in orange. So 1 10th would be here. You see something else is going on in here, but as long as I'm a few, say, five or 10 times away from 0.1 over here at 0.5. Now I'm really on the curve. So this stuff is outside the boundary layer. The boundary layer is what's happening in here. And you can see that the curves are hugging the blue curve more and more tightly. And there's this behavior that's approaching this corner as I make epsilon progressively smaller. So what we're seeing is the kind of non-uniform convergence 
to the blue curve that I discussed at the end of the last lecture. There's, there's something non-uniform happening near x equals zero. Um, you can also, it may be helpful to look at it on log log plot, it's the same data, but uh, you'd see the axis here is a little, I'm zooming in more by using the logarithmic scale. So you can see that the curves again are hugging pretty well out here, but then they're starting to depart as I move in towards the, uh, towards the left side. Okay, so that's as far as I've written out. I'm gonna stop sharing this and go back to handwriting now. Did you wanna ask anything about those Mathematica pictures now that I've taken them off the page? Maybe we can answer without the picture. Is there any question or was that about what you were expecting to see? All right, so let's begin then um, trying to figure out how can we analyze a problem like this. Um, actually, I think before I dive into the analysis, let me just sort of summarize what I said uh, in notes here, just to go over again these ideas of non uniformity. So, uh, as I was mentioning, um, the explanation for what was happening above. Well, um, suppose we fix a positive x and then let epsilon approach zero from the positive side. Then um, you can check that we'll get that the exact solution y of x um, converges to that function I wrote down a minute ago, e to the one minus x. And that's, that's correct. It does pointwise converge to e to the one minus x at any given x, as long as x gets small enough. But the problem is that the convergence is not uniform. in X. So is this similar to the concept that we were discussing um, last lecture about a uh, uniformly valid approximation? Exactly. Does that mean that it's not? Okay. Right, exactly. This, the outer solution um, is asymptotically correct at any given X, as long as you let epsilon get small enough, but it's not uniformly valid over the whole interval from zero to one. So that's why I warmed you up with that at the end of last time, because um, it's happening right now in this solution to this differential equation. So right, it's not uniform in X. In particular, um, I mean, let's see why not exactly. So while it is true uh, that this confusing term e to the minus X over epsilon does go to zero, for epsilon going to zero plus at any fixed X. It is true. Um, that's not what we need for uniform convergence. This would, that's just pointwise convergence. If we want, suppose we want um, this term e to the minus X over epsilon to be less than some number delta. And think of delta as some small number. Delta is something small. Suppose we want that to be the case. Um, what would we need? Then we would need, well, just writing that out. Like think of how, well, all right. So take logarithm of both sides. You would need minus X over epsilon is less than log delta. And for delta small, this log of delta is itself a negative number. Um, um, write it this way. What we're gonna need is, 
thinking in terms of how small does my epsilon have to be at a given x in order to achieve this. I would need epsilon to be less than x over minus log delta, right? That, that is, if I fix my x, in order to achieve this tolerance of delta, to get within delta at x, I'm going to need to make epsilon that this small, less than x over negative log delta. So you see the problem that the necessary epsilon depends on the x that we're talking about. I mean, it manifestly depends on the X through this formula. Depends on the X of interest. So that is not allowed for uniform convergence, right? Uniform convergence would mean that one um, epsilon would work for all X. It might have to be very small, but still epsilon in uniform convergence can only depend on delta, but not on X. So that's um, not allowed. For uniform convergence, maybe I should punctuate it like this. Okay, so we don't have uniform convergence here. And so just to keep drilling it in, the point being that on the interval X between zero and one, there's no value of um, epsilon, even if we allowed it to depend on Delta, there's no value of epsilon uh, that can satisfy this um, inequality independent of X. The inequality in the box. Okay, it will always fail near X equals zero. Okay, so that's the problem. And now just in terms of jargon, um, we saw in the pictures in Mathematica that there was a region of rapid change. We were sort of gradually fall, hugging the curve and then suddenly crashing down to zero, analogous to a spike in a, a neuron or a you know, a pulse in a heart cell. This sudden rapid change is what we're calling the boundary layer. In this problem that we're doing here, the region of rapid change near X equals zero um, which for us was namely X between zero and something of order epsilon or so, which is very thin, um, is called a boundary layer. So that's where the terminology comes from. And there's a little more jargon, which is that, um, We sometimes speak of an inner and outer region. And so when we're doing that, the boundary layer is considered the inner region. And the region away from the boundary layer is the outer region.
Okay, so that's just some jargon that we'll be using a lot. Are there some like specific bounds for this region of rapid change? Like where do you define it? Say, I don't know, it has to be one over 10 or something like that. Or is it just no. approximately where it is? It's very approximate. I mean, you can probably already guess that from what I said when I mentioned 10 epsilon or one tenth of epsilon, it's fuzzy. In fact, that's gonna be my next comment that it's not a, there's not a sharp edge. It, it's it's um, just a conceptual thing that's helpful, but it's not very precisely defined. Okay. Yeah, it just isn't. Nevertheless, it's a useful idea. I feel like I'm kind of crowded here, so I'm gonna move this down a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, so now let's talk about, given that we, we know the exact solution, fine, but what if we didn't? How could we solve a problem like this with a more general technique um, than, than just having to get lucky and have a linear constant coefficient problem? Um, there is a method. And so this is boundary layer theory that we're starting now. So let's do uh, a solution of our little example problem by a method that was historically called matched asymptotic expansions. Um, so it's one of the workhorses of singular perturbation theory. I mean, it's a fundamental method in boundary layer theory. The idea being that we're gonna do an expansion in the outer region, an expansion inside the layer, or something else is happening, and that'll give us an inner expansion. And then we're gonna to try to glue them together to make a matched expansion that will work throughout the whole interval zero to one, both inside the layer and outside. So that's the strategy that the visual for that would be a, a sketch, something like this. Um, let me think of the, the interval from zero to one, let me try to sketch that, you know, something that looks sort of like this. So here's zero, here's one. Um, this is the x-axis. So I'm thinking of the inner region in here. Then as, you know, Maria sort of brings up with her question, there's this fuzzy edge of the boundary layer. Let me use the abbreviation BL for boundary layer. So not exactly clear where I mean, but something like something that scales with epsilon, maybe 10 epsilon, five epsilon. It's unclear in any, I mean, we'll have to see when we do an example, just where we mean, but it's gonna be some small number times epsilon. And then everything else is the outer region. So when I say fuzzy, I mean not well-defined. Okay, so that's the picture. And the idea, as I just mentioned, is that I want to separately solve in each of the regions. Consider the solution in each region and then match them across the layer. Then match them up. At the edge of the layer. Well, maybe I'll say the fuzzy edge of the layer again to emphasize that it's it's not a sharp edge. What we're going to see, just to sort of, I don't like to keep you in suspense, we'll see that there isn't an edge per se, but there is a region of that we're going to call an overlap region. Um, and what we're really doing is matching to get agreement in the overlap region. So it's not just an inner and an outer region. In between them, there's an overlap region. That's a little more refined concept than the edge. So um, 
stay tuned for what I mean by that. Okay, anyway, that's the basic idea. And now what we have to do is look at what's going on in each region. So first let's do the outer because that's easiest. And frequently the outer will be the easier one to do first. Okay, so what's happening in the outer region? So here, what we're gonna do is just use regular perturbation theory. In other words, we're just gonna let epsilon go to zero. We think of X as being fixed. And um, we're just gonna do that as before. In fact, it's what we did at the beginning of this lecture. The only thing though, is that when you look at this picture that I have here, if I'm using regular perturbation theory out here in the outer region, now you can see what I wanna do. I wanna impose only this boundary condition because that's the only one operating in the outer region. This boundary condition that we previously imposed, we shouldn't have, or we sh we were, we're not going to because that belongs in the inner region. So we're just gonna use this boundary condition and solve the differential equation in here but not go through the edge. So now we'll only have one boundary condition and everything will be fine. Um, so for that reason, but we're gonna apply the boundary condition at X equals one only. Okay. so. Just recapitulating those steps from earlier, at order one, we would have y0 prime plus y0 equals zero. And the only boundary condition is the one that says y0 at one is one. And so now everything's reasonable um, when you solve this. Here we would get y0 of x is c e to the minus x. And then y0 of one equals one gives us c e to the minus one. So c is equal to e. And so um, writing that out then, I'm getting y0 of x using the value e, e times e to the minus x. So you can write that as e to the one minus x. Um, that's our outer solution. So y sub out of x at lowest order here. I really should say like y sub out sub zero, it's the zeroth order version of the outer solution. That might look familiar. That's the curve that we got by taking the exact solution and just um, doing that limit process of letting epsilon go to zero at fixed X. So we're, you can see we're already on the right track with this. Uh, but you know, this was only the order one part of it. Um, so I, you know, just to show you what would happen in a typical problem, let's just look at what would happen at the next order. If I went to order epsilon, you could check that the ordinary differential equation would become y1 prime plus y1. If you want, maybe we should just go back. I don't, did I even mention the order epsilon before? Maybe not. So let me scroll back. Just pardon me for a second. Ooh, I'm getting dizzy. Yeah, I never wrote down order epsilon, but we can do it, right? We could just stare at what we have here. If we look at all the terms that have an epsilon in front of them, uh, I have epsilon times y0 double prime. 
there's this epsilon y0 prime, and there's an epsilon y1. And then I also have this one times this epsilon y1 prime, right? You end up getting four terms that all have epsilons in front of them. And similarly, you could read off the uh, boundary conditions from here. This will just give you a y1 of zero is zero and y1 of one is also zero. So anyway, let me now fly back to where I was. At order epsilon, we get this, it turns out. Uh, minus y0 prime, minus y0 double prime. Those are all the terms I just mentioned. I'm writing it in the way where I've got the, the unknown quantity of interest, which is the y1 on the left, expressed in terms of stuff I've already calculated at the previous order. We saw this last time that in perturbation theory, it often works like that, that you use at each order stuff that you calculated at previous orders. So anyway, um, we've got that, but here's something a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit abnormal and non-generic happens in this contrived problem that we're doing, which is that this um, right-hand side is y0 minus y0 prime. Oh, I guess that should be plus, all prime. And you might recognize this expression in parenthesis because we just solved the problem up here, y0 prime plus y0 equals zero. So this expression in here is actually zero. Uh, and so this is zero. And we have boundary conditions on y1, which were that um, y1 at one is equal to zero, is the appropriate boundary condition, it turns out. And so the interesting thing is that when you solve this problem for y1, from here we would get y1 is a constant times e to the minus x. But then when we evaluate the constant, y1 at one will be c e to the minus one, but this is supposed to equal zero. This tells me that the constant is zero, which tells me that y1 of x is actually the identically zero function. So when I calculate at order epsilon, I get nothing y1 at x is identically zero. And what's kind of pathological and extra special about this problem is that this is true at every higher order. That is, if we ground through more details, we would see that y2 is equal to y3. They're all identically zero. So what I'm claiming is, it's not interesting to check, but just trust me that the outer solution turns out to be e to the one minus x to all orders of epsilon. Normally that would not be true. When we do other problems in boundary layer theory, we're gonna get an outer solution that has an order one piece, it has an order epsilon piece and so on. Here it turns out it only has an order one piece and everything else is identically zero. Um, <clears throat> so just, I'll just mention that's highly unusual, but it's a reflection of the, like I say, the very contrived artificially simple problem we're doing here. Okay, so anyway, we've now solved the outer problem. We've got that. Okay, that's fine. And now we finally get to something that's conceptually new and interesting, which is to solve the inner problem. Here's where the first really new ideas come up. Um, and then the idea of matching is also going to be a new idea for us. Maybe I should pause here, though, just to check that you're still hanging in there. How's it going for the outer solution? You're, you're with me on that? 
Yeah. Okay. And if you want something to be picturing, um, I guess if we went back to our diagram that I had shown you in Mathematica, let me remind myself. Um, was that one drawn in blue? Am I remembering right? I think the outer solution would be, you know, something that looked sort of like this. At X equals zero, it's up here at E. And then we were seeing inner solutions that, or sorry, not inner. We were seeing the, um, in the computer, the exact solution had something that was sort of hugging this. you know, for a while, but then it had to match this boundary condition. And so it did something like that. So we have to now try to understand what's happening in, in here. That region of rapid change. And so that's what we're gonna do by looking for what's going on in the inner solution. So that's the next part. Okay, maybe I'll start down here. Okay, so now how do we capture the inner solution? Well, um, the basic idea remember was that I said, this is whatever is going on here, the inner layer is some small number of multiples of epsilon. So it shows you that the, the correct length scale for the problem is something of size epsilon. And it, it very naturally suggests redefining the X variable. Rather than thinking of X as order one, think of X as some number of multiples of epsilon. And so we're gonna introduce a new variable. I'll call it capital X which is the original X divided by epsilon. So this is sometimes called a stretched variable. And it's the natural way to describe what's going on inside the boundary layer. You could think of it as, um, that it measures distance into the boundary layer, BL for boundary layer, um, kind of in a percentage wise sense or fractional sense. So what I'm trying to say is like, you could sort of think of space in two different ways. Think of this as zero, and, but I wanna use a, like a big X scale and also a little X scale. And so from a little X perspective, the place that I would call epsilon in a big X sense, I would call it one unit, All right? Cause little X over epsilon would be one there. And something that's out at two epsilon, which looks tiny as far as little x is concerned, is two whole units of big X. And then the edge of the boundary layer, wherever that is, or the overlap region, is sort of way out there to the right, which from the little x point of view, still looks very close to zero because it's just a few multiples of epsilon. But from the big X point of view, it kind of looks almost like you're out at infinity. You know, in the sense that you've gone one, two, three, 10, 20, 30. So big X equals infinity is gonna sort of correspond loosely, we'll be more precise later, to little x being near zero. Um, 
anyway, so the intuition here is that as we take um, x going to zero, but imagine keeping big X fixed, like say big X is equal to two or something. You know, like if I focus on this, but I think of big X being two, as epsilon goes to zero, you could sort of picture the whole thing sort of sliding to the left, right? Because the epsilons are going to zero, but this is still staying at two. So what, as you take epsilon to zero with X fixed, it's like you're going deeper and deeper into the boundary layer, sort of, or at least closer and closer to the left edge. Smaller and smaller values of little x. Okay, anyway, um, you'll get used to this way of thinking. I realize it might be confusing at this point, but for now, if you want, just think of it as an algebraic trick. I mean, if you prefer your stuff to be symbolic rather than visual, this is just a, we can define a new independent variable, big X to be little x over epsilon. So let's do that. And now let's rewrite the differential equation. Um, actually, to try to avoid confusion, or maybe I should just say reduce confusion, because I'm not sure I'm going to be avoiding it altogether. Um, let me write, when I think of y of x, I'll replace it when I go to the new variables. Um, I'll write it as capital Y of capital X. when I'm in the layer. So I'll use capital letters to mean layer variables. I don't wanna call both of them Y is what I'm saying. It's the same function, but I'm gonna call it capital Y when I'm thinking of it in the layer. So here's, let me just show you what I'm gonna do. Let me find the ordinary differential equation implied by our earlier ordinary differential equation, but now in terms of big Y and big X. So what's the new transformed equation? Well, so the old equation was epsilon little y. Let me write subscripts here to mean which thing I'm taking derivatives with respect to. So little y with respect to little x plus one plus epsilon y sub x plus little y equals zero. What does that become? Well, um, that's what we have to figure out. What does it become? So we have to calculate some derivatives using the chain rule. So for instance, little y with respect to little x. Incidentally, if you're wondering or have any trouble following my handwriting, I'm trying to write capital Y with a vertical stem and I try to make it look bigger. Whereas my little Y is just one stroke with a diagonal stem, if you can see the difference. And my big X will always have a, a top and a bottom on it. Um, I suppose you could write big Y <laughs> like this if you wanna really go nuts, but I don't think I'll be doing that. I tend to write it without the bar on top. Anyway, okay, so little y sub x means, this is where Leibniz notation is really handy, d little y, d little x, which you can think of as d big y, d big x, d big x, d little x. Right, by canceling out the differentials, so to speak. And so what's that? Well, big X, we defined up here as little x over epsilon. So 
So D big X over D little X is one over epsilon. And so this expression reduces to um, big Y sub big X times one over epsilon. And similarly, we could do the second derivative. And what will happen is little y sub two x's, little x's, brings down another factor of epsilon. So it's one over epsilon squared, big Y, big XX. So now I, I've transformed those derivatives and I can substitute them in. Um, I'll take this one and substitute it in here. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'll substitute that one in there and I'll substitute this one right there. Okay, so rewriting the differential equation, then we get, uh, let's see. Okay, so I just have to copy. Epsilon times what I just calculated, one over epsilon squared, big Y, big XX, plus one plus epsilon. Right, so the ODE, becomes this times the little y sub x, which is now one over epsilon y big x plus, let me keep copying, little y is now I'm calling it big y um, equals zero. Now, I've got various epsilons around. Let me multiply everything through by epsilon. So multiplying everything through by epsilon, you get big Y with respect to big X twice plus one plus epsilon Y big X plus epsilon big Y equals zero. I think I did that right. There, so that's our inner ODE. Did you follow all that algebra? You're still okay? Now notice something cool. If you set epsilon equal to zero naively, you do not lose the highest derivative. Isn't that interesting? When we did regular perturbation theory and we set epsilon to zero, we lost the second derivative. Now we don't. Seems magical. <laughs> I see Sarah appearing at the screen, right? Because look at the coefficient. Um, that second derivative doesn't have an epsilon in front of it. I mean, what happened? It used to have the epsilon, but then we created two more epsilons in the denominator because of our rescaling in space. And so, although formally this looked, you know, I mean, being very naive, this term looked small, looked like order epsilon. It really isn't because the X scale is itself order epsilon which contributes two powers of epsilon, so that in fact, this thing is not small. It looks like it should be small, but it's not because the second derivative is changing, it is so large. That's what's happening. The rapid variation is making this term big where this term is small in such a way that together, the whole thing ends up being, in fact, big inside the layer. So anyway, so this is the, the correct thing to do. And um, 
you know, as I say, what you're supposed to notice that um, if we now set epsilon equals zero, we no longer lose the um, the highest derivative. So very nice. And so that suggests that we can just go ahead and use regular perturbation theory on this inner problem. Now that we've got the correct scale, there's nothing to stop us from doing that. So just use regular perturbation theory on this very nice mild problem. Uh, sorry, on the inner ODE. Okay. And also the boundary condition that's appropriate is the one on the left side, which was, if you'll recall, it was that, um, well, I mean, what was the old boundary condition? It was that little y of Let's put it this way, little y of little x equals zero was zero. So the new boundary condition is we would now call it big Y at big X equals zero is zero because although we're just calling little y big Y and um, little x equals zero corresponds to big X equals zero, as I showed earlier with those diagrams. They just differ by a factor of epsilon. So anyway, now we just have to solve our inner problem. I mean, what I'm gonna write is write Y inner as let's call it Y zero plus epsilon Y one plus dot, 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 just doing regular perturbation theory. Um, when you do all the algebra, so I'll start speeding up on this a little bit. The, the order one equation would come out to be y sub zero xx plus y sub zero big X equals zero with a corresponding boundary condition that y zero of zero is zero. Let's just make sure we see that differential equation. Yeah, it looks reasonable, right? What's happening at order one? We've got this term and we've got the one times this derivative and that's it. So that's what we're seeing down here. Okay, anyway, you can solve that. And the solution would be Y zero is some constant, I'll call it A zero plus some other constant B zero E to the minus big X. And because of the boundary condition, um, That tells us that uh, a plus a zero plus b zero is zero, or if you like, a zero is minus b zero. So the whole thing boils down to y zero of big X is a zero times one minus e to the big X. Okay, so I've used my other boundary condition. And now you might be a little bit alarmed, maybe, because we haven't determined a zero. There's this other constant fitting, floating around. But this is where the idea of matching comes in. Here, remember, we only have one solution on the whole interval from zero to one, and we're describing it 
in these two different regions, in the inner region and the outer region, but they have to join up somehow where the inner and outer regions overlap. And so that's how we're gonna determine A0. A0 is determined by matching to, um, well, let me say it this way, by matching Y inner to Y outer. And so we have to figure out how that works. So let me show you two ways of thinking about it. Okay, the most naive way, which works pretty well in this problem, is to just say what I had mentioned earlier, which is if I go back and look at this diagram, and I think about what's happening at this edge, it's sort of like from the standpoint of big X, this edge is way out here at big X equals infinity. Whereas from the perspective of the outer solution, we're getting really close to zero because we're only a few epsilons away. You know, we're, as epsilon goes to zero, it looks like this whole layer is shrinking down to the left end. So what I'm trying to say is the, the most direct way of thinking about it is you could equate um, set the limit as big X goes to infinity of Y zero of big X equal to the limit as little X goes to zero of Y out of little X based on that matching concept. So if we did that, we had that this expression, the outer was, you'll remember was e to the one minus x. So this would just give me e. Whereas y outer of x, sorry, y inner, I have to take limit as big X goes to infinity of a zero one minus e to the negative big X, this limit would just go to a zero. So this method seems to be telling us that a zero should be e. And that's right. So I only have a few minutes left. And so I wanna jump ahead to another way of thinking about all of this that is actually more precise and maybe you'll find it more convincing. Um, and for that, let me go to Mathematica again. I'm gonna stop sharing this um, and share my white, my desktop. Okay. So let me try to illustrate this concept of the overlap region. Is this all visible enough? Yeah, okay. So this was the inner solution. I'm now replacing the big X by what it really is, little x over epsilon. And we showed that it was A times one minus, you know, this expression. We also had the outer solution, there it is. And what I want to do now is plot both the inner and outer solutions on a log log plot so that you can really see what's going on better. And I'm going to use a very small value of epsilon. I'm going to use 10 to the minus four. And what you're going to see is that matching is not really just a matter of matching at a point, which is almost what it looked like I just did in my limit calculation. The really the better way to think of it and the way that Bender and Orsog talk about it 
is that matching is occurring over a whole interval and overlap region. And so that's what I think becomes clear when you look at this picture. What I'm showing is, here's the outer solution in, well, I guess it's sort of red or orange, I can't quite tell. But anyway, the outer solution is this one on this log log plot. I mean, notice the weird axes, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, and so on. These are powers of 10. And these are also logarithmically placed. So the outer solution looks totally flat inside the layer. And then it starts having some variation once we start getting out here to things between or like one tenth and one. All right, so this is the outer solution. Now, look at the inner solution, but think of this inner solution with this prefactor A that is meant to be determined. So I'm showing here some candidate values of A. A equal two, A equals E, which we know to be correct, and A equals four. And so in green, this is when I set the value to four. You see, you get some flatness here that does not agree with the flatness in the outer solution. Likewise, if I use an A value of two, I get the blue curve, which has again gone flat out here, but it's not the right height. The only way to get the flat stuff on the inner solutions to agree with the flat stuff on the outer solution is if you choose A equals E. And then they overlap over several orders of magnitude in X, right? I mean, you can see where do they overlap? This is what I'm talking about, the fuzzy edge of the boundary layer, that this, this edge is really this overlap region that goes from like, I mean, keep in mind, epsilon is 10 to the minus four. So this is epsilon. You can see all the rapid variation was happening for stuff less than epsilon. But once I get to 10 epsilon and I'm here, I'm already in the flat part. And here's 100 epsilon, and here's 1,000 epsilon, right? So over at least a couple orders of magnitude, there's good agreement, but only if you pick the correct A. And so um, that's basically the principle for how you can solve the problem. I, I do wanna finish with one last thing, which is um, a really important concept. I'll, it's gonna, I'm gonna have to go over for a minute or two, but just bear with me. So let me share my uh, writing again. Okay. So if you wanted a good solution over the whole interval, um, you know, not just separately in the inner and outer region, there is a way of doing it. There is a way of getting a uniformly valid approximation. And so the way you do it is this beautiful little construction. You write down something that people call the composite expansion. So this is a uniformly valid approximation to the exact solution. And the way to construct it is this recipe, you write Y composite, so Y sub C is Y outer plus Y inner minus Y match. So this is what I'm calling Y match. Y match is that part where it was flat. We saw over a couple orders of magnitude in the fuzzy boundary layer. So we saw Y match was equal to E in that flat part. And here, if I write Y out plus Y inner, um, well, Y out was E to the one minus X. Y inner would be, it was E, that was our prefactor A, E times, one minus e to the minus x over epsilon, and then minus y match is e. So this is a really clever move. 
why does this work? I mean, basically what we're doing is we're adding the two solutions, but then we're subtracting off the part where they agree so that we don't double count. Right in the part in the matching region, y out and y inner agree, so we'd be counting them twice, and so we subtract off the match, and so this will work in the outer region where the inner is negligible. It will work in the inner region where the outer is is negligible, or it's getting matched by this term. I mean, you can just check that this agrees in all three regions: in the overlap, in the inner, and in the outer. And if I clean up this expression algebraically, watch what it comes out to be it ends up being e to the one minus x minus e to the one minus x over epsilon. The e's cancel out. This term is canceling with this term. And maybe you'll recognize this composite expansion um, because it looks very close to the exact solution. I mean, compare the exact solution. The exact was, y exact was e to the one minus x minus e to the one minus x over epsilon. Exactly the same thing, except that it had a numerator, which was this. Oh, sorry, it had a denominator. But it has the same x dependence. And they only differ by this factor in the denominator. And this factor is very close to one. It's close to one and notice it's just a big constant. So for instance, if epsilon is say one tenth, um, the denominator you can evaluate comes out to be e to the minus nine, which is around 10 to the minus four. So you're, you're getting a really good approximation by doing the composite expansion. And I wanna finish by showing you one last picture in Mathematica, which is right here. So here's the exact solution graphed on this log log scale in blue. Here's the composite solution I just derived. You see it's qualitatively perfect. It's a little bit off, but why? Because I made epsilon gigantic so that you could see something. I did an epsilon of 0.5. If I make a decent, decently small epsilon, um, like here, this is epsilon of 0.2. And now I'm not doing log log, I'm just doing a regular plot. Look at how good the composite is compared to the exact. And if I do epsilon of 0.1, you only see one curve because it's on top. You know, and one tenth is not such a small epsilon. So, so my point is this is working over all the whole interval and it's just beautiful. So um, that's boundary layer theory, our introductory example. And next time we'll start doing more elaborate examples. All right, thanks for your patience. See you later. I have okay. one question. Yes, please. Would um, choosing the big X being small X over epsilon work for every situation or, or is it, do you have to choose some other function of epsilon? That's a very good question. And we'll be discussing that. It, it often works, but not always. So the, that's a question of the so-called thickness of the boundary layer. And we will see how to scale the boundary layer in more complicated problems. Often it will be order epsilon, but not always. So yeah, okay. that's, that's an issue that will come up. I mean, the things that we have to face in the future are where is the boundary layer? Like here, we happen to know it was near X equals zero, but how do we find it if we don't know? Sometimes it will be inside the interval. So then it's called an interior layer. It doesn't have to be at the boundary. You can have in interior layers. You can have layers of different thickness that are epsilon to the half or epsilon to some other power. Um, so yeah, all of that is to come. Good. In Any that, other question? Uh, yes. Oh, in that um, Mathematica plot you showed us that uh, yes. demonstrated that A0 should be E. Yeah, you wanna look um, at it again? Yeah, there was that part on 
the left side or the right side of that picture. Um, yeah, it's, show, the, it's showing for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Um, the yellow line and the red line start to diverge near the edge. Is that saying that the um, solution we get in the inner region no longer explains what's happening in the outer region? Correct. Well, okay. Right, exactly. So yeah, that's right. So let's look at um, what's what. I think I need to make it a little wider. Yeah, okay. So. So right, here's the outer solution, which, I mean, keep in mind, these are tiny numbers. The, the outer region lives in a world where things are order one, right? It's used to thinking about X's that are 0 0.9, 0 0.8, whatever. So it, it's varying perfectly well here, but um, the outer solution, once it gets close enough to zero in X, it just thinks it's taking on the value that it has at X equals zero, which is E. So that's why it looks so flat throughout the inner region, but it varies out here. Meanwhile, the inner solutions vary considerably over the inner region, but once they get too far out so that they're outside the inner region, they think that they're taking on their value at infinity. So they're becoming flat, taking on their asymptotic value at infinity. So, so that's why those curves are flat. Um, then in reference to what Maria just said, if we are choosing the thickness of the boundary layer in some way, does mm -hmm. that then affect how wide that region where the yes. two lines and matches are? It does. It absolutely does. The, the, the um, thickness of the boundary layer would affect the scaling of this overlap region. Like how wide is this? This is something that Bender and Orsog talk about a lot in the book. And um, I recommend you read it, though I have to say, I was never taught it myself. And I don't think I've ever taught it in this course. How does the thickness of the overlap region depend on epsilon? Um, so I might try to teach it this time around. I, I would like to understand this better. So yeah, Bender and Orsog have all these really interesting looking scalings, epsilon to the one third and one fourth. And, you know, like re the region over which matching is taking place. They have a lot of scalings that what I was taught when I was a student was the very naive thing I showed you at the beginning. You just take the limit of one to out to infinity and the other to zero and just make them agree. But but Bender and Orsog insist that's not the right way to think of it. And they talk about this overlap region. And, and very few books really do that. Um, so, but I think they have a nice point of view and I, I guess I'll try to understand it better. And, and maybe we'll be discussing that more, but you, you should try to read it in the book. Thanks, that was pretty cool. Good, okay, yeah. It's, that's one reason I made these Mathematica plots. I wanted to see this region myself. Um, that it's not really just a matching at a point, but matching over an interval that's happening. So anyway, I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to say that the I was I was quite satisfied by the the composite solution that it was oh, like a it's like <laughs> the same kind of thing as when you do like measure of a union. It's measure of one plus measure of the other minus measure of the intersection. Oh, beautiful kind of thing. So it's that sort of inclusion exclusion sort of. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's beautiful. Yeah, it it's a it's cool. a kind of standard trick in certain settings. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> that's right. That's good. Huh. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. Sure. Okay, Mark. See you later. Is thanks. there? I, I see the, the boundary region and the composite solution was really cool. But when we actually calculated um, using the limit procedure there, yes, there, it seems like that's where we got A is equal to E and then used it to like figure out what values we should be plotting here and then what yeah. we should write in the composite solution. Is there right. another way we do that or? Well, I think so. I mean, we, even if we hadn't done that little calculation, we could look at, um, 
I mean, where the E is coming from is the flatness that this, this solution takes on as X goes to zero. So that was determining the E. Um, okay. so, so the match, I mean, the, the level of Y match is determined by the flatness of this, which is controlled. This, remember, the outer solution has no arbitrary constants in it. It's just E to the one minus X. So we can just read off where it's, it's asymptotic value as X goes to zero is just E. And, and will, they, will they always be, when they match? No. Will they always be flat? <laughs> they don't have they? to be flat. Okay. They don't. So this is a little bit artificial in this problem. And so there's a concept called higher order matching. We only matched at zeroth order. Okay. And remember the outer solution was exact to all orders once you knew the zeroth order. So, so there's a finicky thing where you have to do matching at different orders. And I think you can match a whole function over an interval. It doesn't have to be a constant function. Okay. Um, and that again is something I was never taught because zeroth order matching is usually enough in practice. But, but for some problems you might wanna do higher order matching, I guess. And so I always have trouble teaching that part because I dimly understand it. So I'm gonna to try to understand it better with the pressure of recording for YouTube and everything. <laughs> cool. okay. um, but yeah, you, you're welcome to read ahead in the book when they discuss matching. And they even have stuff in the book on matching before they do boundary layer theory. It's like in chapter two and three. So, so they seem to think matching is a very fundamental idea aside from its application in boundary layer theory. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, that's right. It doesn't have to be flat. I don't think it does. It's just, you have to get two functions to agree over an interval to some order of approximation. Cool. Yeah. I look forward to seeing more. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, see you later. Bye.